this looks like a group that's been listening to presentations all day long. <laughs> and I'm, I'm your closer. I, that's a lot of responsibility. I'm going to get you out of here so you can get a drink and go relax, because uh, that's what I'm going to do. Um, <clears throat> I know you've heard from uh, General Saltzman, General Brown already, so I'm not going to try to replow the ground that they covered. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our budget, how we got to it. Um, I, I, first, I want to congratulate Jim Mackley. Who are you, Jim? Yes, sir. I don't know how he did it, but this is the most exquisite timing for this conference I could imagine. So he must have a source in the White House who told him exactly when our budget was going to come out so he could set this up per with perfect timing. So we can all come up here and we can practice our posture hearings in front of you. Um, uh, the, uh, I also want to compliment my counterpart, uh, Christine Wormuth, who I understand uh, was very complimentary about operational imperatives this morning. You know, imitation being the sincerest form of flattery, so I'm, I was delighted to hear about that. She's a really good friend and a very, very capable person and doing a, a fantastic job with the Army. So. Uh, great colleague. Uh, same, same, I can say, of course, of Carlos del Toro in the Navy. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, and uh, if you've heard me speak, you may have heard some of this before, but forgive me for that, but I want to provide some context and then talk a little bit about the numbers. The, um, the China, China, China thing is, is accurate. I came back into government because of my concerns about the threat that China poses to our ability to project power. If you look at our national defense strategy or the national security strategy, we have to do four things, basically. Uh, nuclear deterrent, which is in pretty good shape. We're modernizing that, recapitalizing that. That's all fully funded. Uh, um, protect the homeland. And we have done a reasonably good job of that. We've got to worry about the balloon thing a little bit more. But yeah, I think we're doing pretty well there. The uh, deter and defeat aggression if it occurs, which is the thing that I'm most focused on, because that's where I think we have the greatest challenge. And then, of course, an enduring, uh, capable joint force. So those are the priorities laid out by the Secretary and the defense strategy that we're implementing. And for an organization like Department of the Air Force, which organizes, trains, and equips forces to do those missions, you know, that, that becomes kind of the, the guiding star. And the place where I feel we have some concern, fundamentally, is on that project power and defeat aggression, deter and defeat aggression. So over a year ago now, uh, put together the seven operational imperatives as a way to focus our work within the department at identifying the modernization we needed to keep pace with the threat. And it is quite clear for me, going back over a dozen years, that we were in a race for technological superiority and that we had a formidable opponent, more formidable even than in the Cold War. And I spent 20 years worrying about the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So we, we, I brought in uh, Tim Grayson, as I think most of you know, to help lead that effort. We put together teams of operators and technologists, and we did a lot of work to try to figure out how we were going to address each of those operational imperatives, how we were going to get from the force we had to the force we were going to need to be successful uh, against a threat that is, exists or is emerging and that we're going to have to face. Uh, we came out of that with a lot of good recommendations. Um, we, we put as many of them as we could into our budget internally with the physical guidance we had. Went downstairs to the Office of the Secretary of Defense, to CAPE and to Deputy Secretary, and said, OK, this is all we could get with what we had, but here's the best we can do. We need more money to do these things. And spent the summer last, uh, arguing about that and talking about that and explaining it. And then ended up, last fall, as we were finalizing the budget, uh, the one that we just rolled out, in, I think, a very good position. I am very comfortable going forward to the Congress that the budget for the Department of the Air Force and saying, this is what we need to do our job. And if you think about it in terms of uh, the current force, the immediate requirements that we have to meet over, let's say, the next period of a year or two, and then you look out at the midterm, out to, say, five years, and then a longer term beyond that. And if you look at those three uh, uh, periods of time, what's happening is that over all of that time, the threat is getting more severe. And you can see, if you look at the intelligence, what's being fielded, what's being acquired, how they're being uh, utilized in the force. And essentially, China is working to have a greater capability to keep the US out of the region over time, making a lot of investments in that, and having some success, quite frankly, in the programs that they're fielding. So we've got to respond to that. We can't stay where we are. We've got to move forward. So there's an overarching imperative, if you will, about modernization and getting to the next generation of capabilities. So the seven operational imperatives were our way to identify what we needed to do that. 
Um, most of that work is in the research and development side of the house. So if you look at our budget, what you're going to see is that overall we had a, over a 5% increase, a little better than the DOD at about 3%. Uh, and that within that, the R&D budget in particular increased on the order of 10%. And the Space Force budget increased quite substantially, also on the order of 10%. So that's where the priorities went, was getting to that future. We, we basically kept the, the force that's there today, the current force, at an acceptable level of risk as we move forward to try to get to the things we're going to need in the future. We did invest in more for that midterm. So there's procurement that delivers in two or three years that's focused on that midterm that was increased. And then we put quite a bit into the research and development accounts to get to the systems we're going to need for the future. It's not entirely as clean as that, but that gives you the, the overarching picture. So let's talk real quickly about the operational imperatives and what we did there. Um, space order of battle, that was the first one. Uh, we have defined more of the systems that we need on the communication side. Uh, space Defense Agency is now part of the Department of the Air Force. Uh, getting ready to fly Tron Zero and move forward with a disaggregated communications architecture, which also moving forward with the new missile warning uh, and tracking architecture, which will include the capability to deal with hypersonics. We're working very closely with the intelligence community on some other sensor types that we're going to try to do together as efficiently as possible to meet both operational and intelligence needs. And we're working on the ability to control those things effectively in wartime so that intelligence missions are fulfilled as are operational missions. This is a transformation, going from a, 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 a largely a, a, a basis for our, for our targeting in particular, which is built around systems like AWACS and JSTARS, which are increasingly difficult to, to maintain their survivability on the battlefield, towards more reliance on space. So I'm kind of mixing operational imperatives here a little bit, but uh, it'll be clear to you as I go on. So space, we're moving forward with more resilient architectures. We're also moving forward with the capability to counter the other side space systems. You know, we, we have to have both space and counter space capability. You know, our, our assets, particularly our mobile assets, those aircraft carriers, our airplanes, which we want to move from base to base to confuse the enemy, we don't want them targeted by the other side. We have to do something about that if we're going to project power. And that's a service the Space Force provides for the entire joint force. So we're moving forward on that front as well. I don't know if I should say this or not, but it's late in the day, so I will. Uh, I made a comment out at AFA about, or I made a comment when we were briefing the press about the budget, about needing both hard kill and soft kill capability. And somebody picked up on that. I think she may be in the room. Uh, and General Saltzman told me yesterday in our, in, our, in our tag up that I now had a handle or a call sign. I'm now hard kill. <laughs> so, I went home and told my wife about this, and she started Googling it to see if it was true. Um, I, I'll live with that. I could take that. Um, so anyway, that was a little digression there. Excuse me. Um, so space, that space order of battle. Uh, the next thing is our version, our, our share of JADC squared advanced battle management system, but it's more than that. It's the whole C3 battle management system for the Air Force and Space Force, and modernizing that to be resilient and give us the kind of battle management capability we need to handle the kind of scenarios that we're going to have to deal with as part of the pacing challenge. Or with our acute threat, as we call it, in Europe, if there's an act of aggression there. So we put uh, Luke Cropsey, I think you're all aware of this, Brigadier General Cropsey, in charge of organizing this work, being the technical lead for it, defining what it is we're going to have to have, and we're moving that forward. There are two um, major efforts that come out of that. One is space battle management for what would be a fight in space to control space, uh, preserve our services and deny them to the adversary. And there's a battle management part that deals with the air battle part of it, which replaces some of the capabilities that we currently have on platforms like uh, JSTARS and AWACS and modernizes the, the whole structure of the air operations center and the combat reporting centers at, at lower echelons. And Luke is trying to pull all of that together. He's got a huge job. Uh, but the funding is in there to, to move that forward. The, uh, that effort is off and running. Luke is getting organized. He's bringing his team together. We had our first quarterly review with the two service chiefs and I of, of that effort, and it's on track. We just need to get the next layer of funding to keep it moving and moving forward. Very challenging job that he has. Uh, I mentioned targeting already and what we're doing there. We're still buying the E7. We're continuing with that. 
Uh, we're trying to accelerate it. We hope to accelerate the procurement in the out years, but right now we need to get the first prototypes we'll get that out, out there. Uh, that'll give us a much more capable platform than, than AWACS is, uh, and one that in conjunction with other sensors can do the job of, of uh, air sensing and, and air, uh, uh, air targeting. Next generation air dominance, uh, fully funded the, both the platform and the, one of the big new starts in our budget is the uncrewed combat aircraft. Um, I made a comment out at AFA recently at our conference about how we're, we're going to use as a planning figure a thousand uncrewed combat aircraft as a starting point. I think at the end of the day we'll probably end up with more than that. That's not an inventory objective per se, it's a planning figure. And it's going to allow us to think about basing, uh, organizational structures, maintenance structures, sustainment structures, training, range use, things like that, as we prepare for that to come into the inventory. What we have funded, in addition to an, 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 uh, an EMD program to build that capability in conjunction with or on a parallel course, basically, with the NGAT platform, is in addition to the uh, development program, our, our test articles to allow us to develop and mature uh, autonomous technology, as well as some prototypes that we can put into a unit and start to get unit experience uh, with that kind of a platform. So we got a three-pronged effort. Those last two prongs are risk, risk reduction as we move the mainstream program forward. We're also doing things, of course, to integrate those systems uh, into the force and to provide weapons that are comparable with, with, with that platforms, those platforms. Um, <clears throat> the next one is resilience of our bases. This is an area where we can invest right away to improve our combat capability. Um, so we have things like pre-positioned equipment in there. We have hardening uh, some of our facilities. And we have expansion of the number of bases that we're going to be able to use. We want to make the targeting problem as difficult as possible for adversaries. We don't want them to know where we are. And we want to be able to come in, operate quickly, and then move to another base, make the agile combat employment concept real. So the money's in there to do that. B-21 continuing. There's production money in the budget for the B-21 this year. Uh, so that's going to be moving forward. Uh, you all saw the rollout. It's supposed to fly this year. I hope we can hold that schedule. Uh, that's a critical capability. Um, but there are other things besides the B-21 itself. Uh, there are munitions that are compatible with it that will make it more cost effective. And there are external connections and other systems that can be put into that family of systems. Those are also funded. Last thing on our list was um, hardening of our capability to go to war looking at all the things we rely upon. Uh, as we looked at that, we found places where we had not invested in cybersecurity, for example, hadn't modernized our IT systems. We had uh, several billion dollars of what we call tech debt that we need to pay down. So we invested in that. We put a sizable investment into that. So across that spectrum of things, they're all associated with uh, our ability to protect power and getting back to having a more resilient and more combat effective force. Some of them will happen relatively near term, like the base hardening things. Others are going to take a development program and then, and then the lead to fielding and production and fielding. Overall, there are about a dozen new start programs in our budget. And there are about 20 significantly enhanced efforts uh, together with the new starts. That adds up to about 20. That's a lot of things that we're doing. The amount of money we're able to allocate directly to recommendations that came out of the operational imperative work is on the order of $5 billion. The amount of money going into those portfolios of OI-related work is about 25 or $30 billion. Most of it R&D. Uh, we have to make these down payments on our future capabilities, or we're not going to have them. I look at the research and development as essentially buying options for future production. If you don't buy those options, you're not going to have them when the time comes to put things into production. So we're gambling a little bit on the size of future budgets. Uh, I don't think it's a gamble at all to say that the threat is going to get worse over time and we're going to have to respond. So I think it's, it's done uh, with our eyes open with the expectation that those funds will be found because they will be necessary uh, to keep the Air Force in the position we want it to be in. Overall, big picture on the budget. Um, <clears throat> one of the truths about any service budget, I think, is that there's an enormous amount of fixed cost, and I'll call it that just for lack of a better phrase, associated with the current force that you have. 20% of our budget pays salaries. 36% of our budget pays for O&M for the fleet that we already have. Another 20% or so, or 16% in our case, goes into production of things that are just recapitalizing things that are retiring out of, out of the force. And then R&D buys your future. And as again, we're gonna have about 26% of our budget in R&D 
It's the biggest single increase. It's a necessary thing to do if we're going to be successful in the future against the threat that we see coming. Uh, I feel like we have a very good story to tell. I'm looking forward to telling it to the Congress. I expect to have support across both sides of the aisle. The, the, um, the sequence of events we've been on with the Congress, last year we took a threat briefing to all of our committees and to a number of other members to try to educate them about the problem that we faced. The question I always got at the end of the threat briefing was, well, what are you doing about it? The answer was, we're working on the seven operational imperatives. And now the answer will be, we're doing what's in our budget, and we need you to fund it. So before I take questions, I'm going to close with what I think is my biggest concern as we go into this year, into this cycle, is getting the authorization and funding we're going to need. Um, we're, we're in a very difficult political environment. I'm very comfortable with the support from our committees. We spent a lot of time with Hack and Sack D and the Hask and the Sask. There, there's a lot of support on both sides of the aisle in those committees. I'm not concerned about that terribly. Bills will come out of those committees. I'm concerned about getting them passed in what is a fairly polarized and contentious year in a year leading up to an election. So that's the thing I'm going to be emphasizing more than anything else as I, as I go up and do testimony is the need for timely appropriations. If we don't get those resources, those 20 enhanced efforts and those dozen new starts will not happen for another year. They will not happen for another year. That is a free year we are giving to China to continue to try to race and be ahead of us. And you should make no mistake about the degree to which we're in a race for technological superiority. It's been going on for a while. Uh, we just haven't been fully engaged, but we are now, and we're ready to move forward. We just need the resources to do so. So I will stop there and take your questions. Thank you. We've got your credit card. Um, but, but that's not the question. And so I, I really love it. You and I are in China early together. Yeah. Um, but last summer, Deputy Secretary Hicks gave the Air Force a new mission. We did not talk about it. And that's cruise missile defense of the homeland. Can you say a couple of words on how that's going? Uh, give me a chance to, uh, thank you, Al, because that gives me a chance to clarify. <laughs> Uh, what, what was, uh, I think Bill LaPlante was actually responsible for this. I'd, basically what the Air Force, Department of the Air Force has now is acquisition authorities over, over that area. We don't have a new mission. It is not our mission any more than it always was to do cruise missile defense of North America. But we're in general responsible for the acquisition authorities for programs in that area. So uh, to the extent that the Army does air defense or even the Navy's involved in that, or the missile defense agencies involved, uh, we did not get a change in mission. We got a change in responsibility for administering the acquisition system for programs in that area. So it's a fairly narrow uh, thing. And one of, the, one of the things that happened, I'm glad you brought it up, because people are reading it the way you did, and are, are where you implied. And that is not accurate, OK? We're, we're, not, um, we're not tasked with that mission any more than we already had it. We're buying, uh, I didn't talk much about what we're doing in the middle for time frame. But we're buying more F-35s this year than we had programmed last year. We're at 48 flat across the FIDIP. We're buying another uh, 25, I believe, or 24 F-15EXs this year. The reason to do that in part is the cruise missile defense mission. But it's not because we've taken on that mission writ large as it's solely a Department of the Air Force mission. Thank you. The, uh, the missile tracking capability that we're talking about will contribute to that significantly. And we do have other, other, other aspects of that, but there's no fundamental change in missions. Oh, to your left, sir, I'm sorry. Hi, Secretary Kendall, right over here. Doing the right on the CQ roll thanks for doing this. You've got a dozen, a dozen new starts in your budget request, as you mentioned. Given the political environment and the real potential for a lengthy CR, how are you proactively working to mitigate any potential budget delays that would prevent you from moving forward on those? And separately, do you have any reservations about including that number of new starts in your request, just given the safety things on the hand? Thank you. No, we, we need what we need. And uh, we need the approval of the Congress to, to move forward. You know, that, that's our system. Um, so I'm not, I have no hesitation about that. And I, there's no workaround for this that I'm aware of. I, I am pursuing a legislative proposal that hasn't been cleared yet that would allow us to start without waiting for a new start authority. Um, when Senator McCain had the SASC, he was very firm about 
uh, new starts not happening until the committee and the bill had passed that would authorize them. That basically cost us a year and a half to two years to wait for that. So what, uh, and just Senator McCain, who I have great admirer of, was also uh, very interested in moving faster. So he was in conflict on that. So what, what I'd like us to have um, is the authority to begin programs without waiting for a budget cycle and, and bills, you know, acts, congressional acts, uh, without making any long-term commitment. Let us get started, do some of the early stage analysis, requirements definition, preliminary design, uh, conceptual definition, do some of that early work, which is relatively inexpensive and reduces lead time substantially. Uh, do it in a competitive environment. Don't commit to a single contractor and don't commit to anything long term. Let the, let the Congress have authority to authorize that. But give us that lead time back that is taken up now with our process, basically. Um, I've been talking about this for years, and I, I, th I think we need it, given the problem that we have and the degree to which we're being challenged. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get that out and, and put it in front of the Congress. Thank you, Senator Green. The Warren Fish with L3 Technologies. Curious if you can expand a little bit on the divestments in aircraft this year. Sure. Earlier this afternoon, uh, General Brown indicated that the fighter construct is now probably just four, not four plus one, because of the A10 divestment being accelerated. There was a report that you were going to work those divestments. Yeah, you could you could call the CCAs a plus one if you wanted to, I guess. The, the um, yeah, we we do have some investments in the budget. We have about 310, if I remember the number correctly, uh, aircraft coming out. Um, we're taking out about 40 uh, A10s. We're continuing down the road to removing the A10 fleet. I'm a huge fan of the A10. I'm an Army officer after all, uh, but it's a 40 year old plane, 40 year old airplane now. Beyond that. Uh, and it's not going to be uh, effective in the environment that we're, we're most worried about. So we want to bring those out the, um, and continue down the path of retirement of those. There were some uh, 32, if I remember right, F-22s we tried to take out last year. We're going to try and do that again. Uh, these are not really fully capable aircraft. They're used for training. They're not realistic training because they don't have some of the systems that the more advanced aircraft have. And we can accomplish a training mission with, with other aircraft. So it's not a major reduction in our combat capability, even though it, it's nominally a fifth generation aircraft. Uh, we're continuing to divest some of the T1s, the trainers for multi-engine. We've got a more efficient way to train our pilots. We have uh, some aircraft that are just being recapitalized and coming out because of replacement. Uh, C-130s, our H's are coming out, a uh, small number. We've got continuing to divest AWACS and J-STARS that we were already on that path. And uh, what did I leave out? Um, some of the older F-16s, as F-35s come on, and F-15Cs. So when you add them all up, uh, the thing that I expect there'll be a lot of conversation about on the Hill are the F-22s and the A-10s more than anything else. Thank you. John Harper, thanks to Yeah. And you mentioned the Department of Defense and the CCA program, uh, the 1,000 uh, aircraft is kind of the, the notion of a plane number of things that it might be more. Do you have any kind of number that you think is more likely? <laughs> no. Um, we've got a lot of work to do on this. I mean, we've, we've, we've made the determination that the technology that was there to support going down the path that we're going down. We, we are we're absolutely convinced from our analysis of the cost effectiveness of doing this. So the feasibility we're comfortable with, the cost effectiveness we're comfortable with. Where we're going to end up in terms of inventory, we're not sure of yet. We've got a lot of analysis to do to sort that out. But, but uh, what General Brown and I wanted to do was give people a planning figure First of all, I'll give everybody a sense of the kind of numbers we're talking about. We're not talking about 10 or 100 or 200. We're talking a serious number of aircraft here. Uh, but that, that allows our planners to start to think about organizational structures, whether they're hybrid structures with crewed and uncrewed aircraft in the same wing, so to speak, or they're separate structures and how you make them work together. And we've got to start looking at the basing situation. Uh, what the bane of my existence is basing decisions. Uh, you always make somebody unhappy, right? Um, and, and so this is going to be introducing a lot of new platforms to the inventory, and we've got to figure out where we're going to put them. There, there is no reduction in our planned crude fighter acquisition uh, programs. Um, these are an adjunct to um, a crude aircraft. And the way I talked about them sometimes is that the pod that was under your wing that has a targeting pod or an EW pod or weapons are now going to be flying with you but not attached to you. They're going to be on another aircraft that you're going to control. And so they complement the crewed aircraft and make it much, much more capable and effective. 
the cost point is uh, a fraction of an F-35, and that allows us to have an affordable Air Force as well. So, uh, but we're not ready to talk about, th that number is a reasonable place to start. Um, you know, it, it, I, I think I've made public statements of the fact that it could be twice that many or more, I don't know. Uh, but that gives us a reasonable place to start thinking about what the implications are for all the aspects of the force once you bring them in the inventory. And you said a fraction of the cost of an F-35, can you be more specific about that? We're gonna work hard to get that down. Um, we want the capability we need. Uh, we're gonna have modular mission equipment, so you don't have to put everything on every one of the platforms. Uh, Dale White, General White, leading that program as well as NGAD. Uh, we're working hard with industry. It's going to be a very competitive program. There's a lot of interest in it. I think we're probably going to have some international partners as we go for, further. So getting the cost down so where we use the word attributable sometimes. These are not things, you're, they're not expendable. They're not going to be zero cost. They're not going to be like a munition. Uh, but we want to be able to, uh, and there's a tactical advantage to being able to sacrifice some of these uncrewed platforms effectively to get an advantage operationally. So we got a lot of work left to do on these, uh, but we're pretty comfortable that we're on the right path uh, overall. So you don't have a specific target number? No. <laughs> Give me a couple of years until it's a program of record and we can work our way through the analysis. Second, I have a D21 question. Go over there, sir. Yep. Hi, hey, Tony, how are you? What is an acceptable level of concurrency in the B-21 program? Now, production dollars have um, this year. You know, you famously said the F-35 acquisition no practice. You know, good for the goose, but not for the gander. Um, there was excessive overlap of development and, and production in the F-35. Significantly excessive. I think, you know, I think it was like a if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I looked at that schedule. You know, we were, we were buying airplanes in production like a year before we flew the, 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 the final design, right? Um, we're not gonna do that with B-21. Bill, Bill LaPlante and I structured the B-21 program together back in the Obama administration. It was structured to be aggressive, but not crazy. And in general, given the threat that we face, we need to take some risk. We're not, there's no such thing as a risk-free program, but there's prudent risk and there's crazy risk, all right? Um, for a new aircraft that's a new design, uh, completely new design, having some degree of flight testing in your pocket before you commit to production is a really smart idea. So we, we have some of that, but that doesn't mean you want to do all the flying program before you start production. You want to do enough to feel comfortable that the design is stable and that what you take into production isn't going to have to have major modifications after you've made that commitment. So that, that's what it's all about. And it's, it's very much a technical decision and a risk tolerance decision based on the specific design that you're building and how much risk there is in it. So when you look at the B-21 and you say, okay, what are the hard things to do in here? And what am I gonna have to do in testing to convince myself that I've been successful at them? And you'll have knowledge points at that time from the test program that you can then say, okay, we're gonna go ahead and produce and we feel that it's a reasonable risk to do that. So that's, that's the logic of it, okay? And it's not a, none of these things, unfortunately, are black and white rules where you know, one thing is always the right answer. It's very situationally dependent. What's your confidence level that it will fly this calendar year? I thought it was supposed to fly like soon after the rollout. Um, it has slipped from the original schedule that we were using as the schedule to manage by, by um, a few months, I believe. I'm, I'm recused on the program, by the way, because of my previous involvement with the company. So I'm not as in depth on B-21 as I would be otherwise. Thank you. Okay. It's still within the, uh, the baseline, I think, that we originally had for the program, if I remember right. One more over here, sir. One more to the right turn. Yep. Uh, Stephen Lowe's Defense News. Can I ask you a question about the uh, decision to restore some of the purchases of F 15 EXs um, from 80 to about 104? Um, can you talk about the, uh, the, did the TAC Air study inform that, or was there, were there other kind of research or conclusions that you reached where you decided more, more EXs were needed? And is it possible that in follow-on, maybe 25 or beyond, this is, this is the helicopter program you're talking about? No, the F-15 EX. Oh, the F-15. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Could, could more be restored? Um, there's no intention to do that right now. I mean, we, we have a larger budget. You know, we, the 23 came out a lot bigger than we had asked for. And so, you know, 24 is an, an increase on that. So basically, we have the capability to buy more. 
Um, and so we did the same thing with F-35. Yeah. So we're going to quick, quick question, sir. I'm assuming from the, the contested airspace over Ukraine, I'm assuming your answer would be from the U.S. Air Force perspective that air security would be not negotiable in China fighter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hard kill. <laughs> the, uh, no, look, the number one mission of the Air Force is to control the air. Yes, sir. And that's what we're going to do. <laughs> okay. yes, no question about it. <laughs> yes, sir. And then uh, we're about down to the last couple of minutes. Uh, when I looked at your budget quickly, what I saw was uh, you, know, you channeled a lot of money into the, the nuclear traffic compensation. Yep. Um, you took care of your first public strike command as a bedrock foundation. Uh, I was impressed and surprised that they have two point four billion for the big camera jazz on multi years. Yep, we did three, I think. Uh, Amram, Jasm, and JSM, if I remember. Yep. Yes, sir. And, yep. Uh, I was definitely pleased to see the, uh, the increase in both the F 35 and the, the F 15 X, but really get you to 72 for your first time. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, the truncation of the KC line into the two different programs of the KC 135. Look, the, the mobility change is driven by the threat. Um, we have got to have more survivable platform yes, for, for tanking. Uh, and we got to get to it. I think we need to get to it as quickly as we can. A dollar by itself wouldn't do me much good, Jim. Um, <laughs> if you're asking me what my regrets are in the budget, which I think is what you're getting at, uh, every budget, you know, there's always more you can buy. Um, I don't have an upper list. I'm a I, I'm supporting the president's budget. Um, we made a decision that I think was the right decision given the constraints that we have, uh, but that I worry about a little bit. And that is the engine decision on the F-35. Okay. So that would probably be something I would, if we, if we had the opportunity to reconsider that, I think that would be something I'd be, I'd like to uh, have another shot at. But right now it's unaffordable. The only service that wants that, uh, the, the new technology, uh, is the Air Force right now, and we can't afford it to power ourselves. And that is important about the G1 and the Force posture. What's the rough order magnitude for the Argentinian and separately for the procurement that the other have to find out? Oh, for that, the problem is it's a multi year program with several billion dollars. So it's not, it's, it's a major lift. Uh, and you know you just can't do everything. Sir. Any last questions to the audience? Oh, there's always one, sir. I tried so hard to get you to that drink. Sir. I'm all right. Yes, sir. I guess it's too early to say Secretary Harkill. It's too early to start saying Secretary Harkill. Or ABMS. What do you see as the next steps going forward on ABMS and? Is it too early to start bringing some of our international? Sure. Yeah, the, with ABMS as it's structured, uh, there are some uh, core programs that were part of the ABMS. Uh, there's a pod that goes on KC-46, for example, to integrate uh, advanced radios. Uh, there's that investment. There's some infrastructure investment, and there's some decision support investment that's being made. Uh, there's also engineering, system engineering, essentially, to define this. I usually, I don't think I did this with this group, but um, I've, I've done this a lot of times. The, the way I characterize uh, the journey we've been on, if you will, for JADC squared in the Air Force and for ABMS is that it started out uh, a few years ago with this idea of a beautiful palace. Have you heard me talk about this, some of you? Yes, sir. Yeah, Jim has heard me here talk about this. But basically the idea was we were going to build this beautiful palace. And in the palace, there would be all these rooms in which people would be you know, doing their operations, and everybody would have access to information from every other room in the palace. And everybody would have tools that would allow them to make perfect decisions, fuse data from everywhere else in, in this enormous structure that was entirely you know, the joint and combined force, right? Um, that was a great vision. But nobody really drew a design of the palace, what it would really look like. They just had the vision. And people who were working on various things in our community started saying, hey, I'm working on a brick for the palace. 
This is part of, you know, this big palace. And other people over here said, I've got a great brick too. I'm doing part of the palace. Um, and I looked at this from the outside, from industry. Some of the people in industry from the room probably nod their heads about this perception we had. You know, where, where's the reality of this? It's a great idea, but where is it? And each service went off to do experiments and work on bricks. And we didn't pull it all together into a well-defined product that we're going to build and integrate. So what we've done in the Air Force with Luke's team is put somebody in charge of defining that product and defining all the interfaces and the pieces and the bricks that all have to come together. Did I ever do this with you guys? No, sir. I didn't. OK, I didn't think I did. That was AFA last week. AFA last week. This, right. is, a new, this is a new audience, sir. Thank you. Got, 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 got that. There have been several, actually. Um, so uh, what Luke Cropsey has been tasked to do, and it's the hardest job I've ever given anybody, and I'm not exaggerating at all about that, is to figure out what we're really going to build. What is the new battle management system for the Air Force and Space Force and the new command control and communication system that we're going to use operationally against this pacing threat in the most severe scenario that we're going to have to deal with? What is it actually going to be? What are all the parts of it? What are all the bricks? And who's going to build each of those bricks? Where are they? Uh, and how are they going to fit together? So Luke has got to define that technically. He's teamed with operators from both the Air Force and the Space Force to help do that and define it in a way which meets operational needs in a way that operators are comfortable with and will be able to effectively use. So there's a big system engineering effort going on to do that. We're confident that the pieces that we have funded in the budget will be part of the structure that we're going to build at the end of the day. And they will contribute to reducing the risk to get to that structure. But we have got to have a much more disciplined uh, design, a much more well-defined design with uh, things that you have in every program, like an integrated master plan, integrated master schedule, and specific deliverables that will come in at specific times and integrate together and be tested to give us the actual capability we need. Uh, Luke has put his team together. They're well off and running. Uh, I think I did mention this. And um, uh, I, I, I think I've got as good a team as we can pull together to do this. But it is an enormously difficult job. If you have never heard of them, future combat system, single integrated air picture, future imagery architecture, there's a long list of programs that are all complete failures to try to do something like this. I've worked on a couple of them. I've burned, I've, I've spent a lot of hours not getting things done on some of those programs or overseeing them. Uh, if you look at the history of DOD and you look at, um, and if you look at one of my reports from when I was ATNL, the most unsuccessful programs, Al, you know this, the most unsuccessful programs in the history of DOD are joint C3 battle management programs, period, by a wide margin. And JADC squared conceptually is the most ambitious one we've ever had. So unless you are disciplined and focused and have a high quality team and have a well-structured program, you're going to fail. So that's what we're trying to get to. Thank you. All right. The J, the joint piece? Well, we got two. We had space and air. And uh, I, we had our first quarterly review with the service chief, my service chiefs. And we invited the J6. We invited the CIO we, of OSD. We invited ANS, Bill LaPlante. We invited Heidi Shu. Next time, we're going to invite the services as well. So we are doing this in a very open and transparent way with all the stakeholders. And I know that the deputy secretary, she's brought in uh, Craig Martell to be the Craig Martell to be the chief data and, and uh, AI officer, and Bill LaPlante is setting up an, an effort to manage the technical side of this as well. So, and John Silverman on the uh, CIO side for OSD. We've also got Mary O'Brien, Air Force Three Star, as the J6 right now, and she's on top of it from the joint perspective. So. I think in a way we're leading the way in terms of getting ourselves organized and, and structured for success, but it's got to be done with all the other stakeholders as well. And then, of course, you've got the international piece to add to it as well. So it's, it's, it's big. Um, but I, I, I feel like we're moving in the right direction now, at least, and that we're better organized for success. Okay. All right. With Thanks, that, Jim. Thank you, Secretary Kendall.